Welcome to the webinar, Pharmaceutical Innovation and Production in the Edmonton Metropolitan Region, hosted by Edmonton Global in collaboration with the Trade Commissioner Services of Canada in The Hague and Brussels. Good afternoon to our participants in Europe and good morning to our panelists and participants here in Canada. Uh, welcome to everybody around the world who's joining us today. My name is Stefan Scherer. I'm part of the trade and investment team at Edmonton Global, responsible for the life sciences sector in Europe. This is the first webinar in a series of webinars hosted by Edmonton Global in the coming months. Please note, this webinar will be recorded and the recording will be available at the website of Edmonton Global later this week. We are maintaining physical distancing here in the theater, uh, just for your information. The objective of our webinar today is to introduce the Edmonton Metropolitan Region with regard to its pharmaceutical innovation and production opportunities. As you have seen in the program of the webinar, it is structured as follows. We will start with a brief introduction from the partnering trade commissioner offices, followed by some general information about the region. Then we will move to the presentations by our panelists. Michael Overdoon from the University of Alberta, Andrew McIsaacs, Applied Pharmaceutical Innovation, and Greg Clark from Gilead. Following these presentations, we will have about 20 minutes for a question and answer period from the audience moderated by my colleague, Aman Preet. Questions can be submitted anytime during the presentations using the chat functions. Questions will be answered during the Q&A portion of the webinar. Please mention in the chat your name and affiliation and to whom your question is directed. Now I would like to introduce Samina Qureshi, Councillor Commercial and Senior Trade Commissioner in the Netherlands at the Canadian Trade Commissioner Services in The Hague, and Michelle Gartland, Councillor Commercial and Senior Trade Commissioner in Belgium and Luxembourg at the Canadian Trade Commissioner Services. Hi, everybody, and greetings from The Hague, and thanks, Stefan, for the opportunity to say a few words about the Canadian Trade Commissioner Service. As an Edmontonian, it's a pleasure to collaborate with Edmonton Global on this webinar. We're part of Global Affairs Canada, which is a federal department, and this year we are 125 years old. The first trade commissioner took up his posting in Australia back in 1895. And since then, we've evolved and we have both domestic and international networks of trade commissioners, including in Edmonton and in over 160 cities worldwide. And our mandate is not only to support Canadian exporters, but also to assist companies interested in investing in Canada and seeking a Canadian innovation partner. We can help you with your next investment decision by acting as your pathfinder to key contacts we work with federal, provincial, and municipal partners, such as Edmonton Global. We can provide you with sector-specific market intelligence, as well as information and advice on how to set up a business in Canada. As well, we can help facilitate site visits to identify a strategic location. So some of that, that information is on the slide you see. The place to start is in Canada's branch office in the embassy near you, where you can meet with us to discuss your plans. There are great opportunities in the Edmonton region that you'll hear about today, enhanced with CETA, the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement. We look forward to working with you. And thank you so much. And over to Michelle Gartland. Thank you, Samina and Edmonton Global, and welcome to this webinar. I'm the Senior Trade Commissioner at the Canadian Embassy to Belgium and Luxembourg, and I am your Canadian connection on the ground ready to work with you on everything from trade, investment, to innovation. Un accueil particulier à nos partenaires et entreprises de Luxembourg. Bienvenue et merci pour votre participation. And congratulations on Luxembourg's recent ratification of CETA. CETA paves the way for EU and Canadian pharmaceutical firms who benefit from improved labor mobility, expanded access to government procurement opportunities, and mutual recognition of compliance certification processes for pharma manufacturing practices. I invite you to connect with us, your Canadian partners on the ground here, who work closely with our Dutch and Luxembourg counterparts who are with us on this call today to help our companies grow and go global. 
On that note, I turn it back to you, Edmonton Global, to start this webinar. Thank you, Samina. Thank you, Michelle. At this point, I will provide some general information about the Edmonton metropolitan region. Edmonton is the capital of the province of Alberta, at the west of the Canadian prairies and bordering to British Columbia. The Edmonton metropolitan region is Canada's fifth largest economy and the fastest growing region in the country. Over 1.5 million people and approximately 800,000 jobs are located in the greater Edmonton region, offering access to talent and diversity. The region has significant expertise in engineering, manufacturing, nanotechnology, and agriculture, as well as offers world-class health research and expertise in computer science and artificial intelligence. It is also an energy-rich region at the center of the petrochemical development of Western Canada. Recently, the Alberta government has announced a job creation tax cut, bringing the provincial corporate tax down to 8% which is the lowest rate in Canada by far. Young, educated, and growing. These are the values of Edmonton Global and the region. One of the youngest regions in Canada and celebrated as the best community for youth and youth work. The region is among the most educated in the world with more than 130,000 students enrolled in seven publicly funded post-secondary universities and at colleges. This attracts a large number of foreign students and is recognized as the most entrepreneurial region in the country. The Edmonton metropolitan region has significant capacity in the field of life sciences and pharmaceutical innovation. Alberta Health Services is the largest integrated health system in Canada with a budget exceeding 14 billion Canadian dollars and with a digital health record for the province. World-class research expertise with a number of post-secondary research institutes and the Federal Canada Nanotechnology Research Center located in Edmonton. An extensive commercialization and innovation ecosystem exists as well. To name a few, applied pharmaceutical innovation, we will hear from them later, Tech Edmonton Health Accelerator, Health City, Bio Alberta, and Genome Alberta, to name a few. Noteworthy also to mention, Edmonton is home to the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute, short AMI, one of the three major centers of the Pan Canadian Artificial Intelligence Strategic Initiative, which attracted offices like Google Brain, Google DeepMind to the region in the past years. Biotechnology, pharmaceuticals, medical devices, and research on the causes and treatment of diseases are all areas of innovation in the region. Nearly 70% of Alberta's life science companies, as well as close to 60% of Alberta's biotech companies are based in the region. The Edmonton metropolitan region has recorded 200% growth in biotech research and development spending, and the sector is contributing nearly 7.5% to the region's GDP. The Edmonton International Airport is the first airport in Canada and the most northern airport in the world to achieve certification from the International Air Transport Association as a center of excellence in pharmaceutical logistics. The airport offers direct flight connections to Amsterdam with KLM, and both KLM and Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam are also pharma certified, making it a natural connection point. Further, the Edmonton International Airport offers direct flights to Asia, and because of our northern routes, we are the closest airport by flying time to most major centers in Asia. Canada gives investors preferential market access through 14 trade agreements to 51 countries. To mention a few, CPTPP with the Trans-Pacific Partnerships, the Canada-United States-Mexico Agreement, which was recently replacing NAFTA, and CETA, mentioned by Semina earlier. I also want to mention Port Alberta, a foreign trade zone where investors are eligible for duty and tax relief, 
as well as value-added manufacturing to create Canada-labeled products. The region has an integrated supply chain and offers connections by rail, road, and air to the rest of the world. A direct train link to Port of Prince Rupert offers access by ship to Asia three to four days faster compared to other Pacific ports. Other features are the circumpolar air traffic routes to Asia and Europe, as well as a 24-hour airport access. Now we are moving on to the panelists for the session, and you can find more information on the speakers in the email you received with your registration. First is Dr. Michael Overdoon. He's a professor in the Department of Biochemistry at the University of Alberta, founder and co-director of Discovery Lab, among other positions he holds. Michael joins us remotely. Michael, the floor is yours, please. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'd like to give you my personal experience having moved to Edmonton five years ago. The primary reason I moved was because although I'd had a great research program in the UK, I wanted to commercialize some of the outputs of that research. And I thought that Edmonton and Alberta were very innovation friendly, very blue sky thinking, very open door. And in fact, they are very much. Uh, I've really enjoyed my time here. I came as a professor in the Department of Biochemistry, and I lead Nanook, which is a national facility uh, that offers access to magnets to study protein structures, uh, metabolomics, uh, drug discovery, lead generation, hit identification. And uh, that's been really a, a remarkable journey. It's been running as a facility since 1990, and we're currently expanding the infrastructure there. One of the programs that we've spun out is TMIC, which is an international, uh, internationally recognized center for metabolomics, uh, both in the pharmaceutical space, nutraceuticals, um, environmental metabolomics, and it now also encompasses uh, six different centers across Canada, but the node, the, the lead node is in Edmonton. And so Alberta has great infrastructure, both the academic facilities and also the companies that we work with. Um, there are many, many small companies that engage with the university, and I've really enjoyed that, uh, being a part of that ecosystem and watching the economy diversify. One of the programs that I set up that has commercialization uh, potential that we're currently pushing quite hard on is the styrene malic acid lipid particle project, or SHMALT for short, where we're uh, solubilizing membrane protein targets. Uh, and this research is funded by a lot of uh, great funding bodies in Alberta, also the Wellcome Trust, which funds internationally. And one of the projects that I've set up is Discovery Lab. I'll walk you through some of these projects just briefly, and I look forward to any questions. So this is a project that we've been running uh, with European collaborators for about 10 years. We took a look at some of the understudied kinases. Uh, you may know that there are about 500 kinases, of which only about 90 have really been exploited for drug discovery. And so we tackled some of the others and found CAMK1D, uh, which is a kinase in the human genome that's calcium activated to be one really terrific target by a number of criteria. It gave great spectra by NMR spectroscopy as shown at point two. And so we pursued that further. Uh, it was known at that point to be involved in cancer. And we did the lead generation using NMR and other biophysical methods using funding from GlaxoSmithKline uh, and also the Wacom Trust to identify binding pockets for these uh, small molecules. Um, both by NMR and also other facilities. There's a BIACOR facility down the hall as well. So there's great biophysics. And in the past uh, few months, we've just got another $800,000 of equipment from the Canadian government to get additional biophysical equipment to screen for ligands using um, uh, high throughput methods. Uh, also for lipids, which I'm particularly interested in. And we've used all this data then to identify binding modes, both NMR, X-ray crystallography, um, and there's, of course, the Canadian light source is not far away, so we have a synchrotron nearby. Um, and then we've used structure-based design to develop a library of inhibitors. And there's a lot of great chemistry uh, in Edmonton in particular. So there's Rain Pharmaceuticals that we collaborate with, Fedora Pharmaceuticals, uh, ChemRoots, Alberta Research Chemicals Incorporated. Uh, these are all medicinal chemistry-based companies that are happy to collaborate and, uh, and contract for uh, small molecule uh, drug discovery projects. And we've tested these, these inhibitors and we just published our first paper in JMED Chem looking at their uh, efficacy and diabetes models. That really 
nor take place in a large pharmaceutical company and do this in an space because of the quality of the infrastructure and, and the collaborators, uh, including the Structural Genomics Consortia, which is both based here in Canada and in Frankfurt, as well as companies um, uh, in, in the UK, Signature Discovery in particular. And so this has really been an international collaborative effort. And this is a project that I started 10 years ago, and it's been great to see this carry forward. And we're now looking also at triple negative breast cancer and Alzheimer's uh, targets for these kinase inhibitors uh, using funding from uh, Alberta funding bodies. Next slide. So kinase, as I've talked about briefly, the critical targets for cancer in particular, but even more valuable are the membrane protein targets, including GPCRs. And historically, these have been expressed as recombinant proteins, but we've taken a totally different approach, expressing them uh, or taking them from their natural hosts, whether they're mice or, or human tissue. And we use a, a polymer known as styrimoleic acid, this is a polymer that was developed by a company, Polyscope, which is based in the Netherlands. And we've really had a, a tremendously uh, mutually beneficial partnership with them. We're expanding the library of, of polymers and they've been developed by Polyscope initially for industrial purposes. And we are redeploying them for drug discovery and creating new polymers that have affinity tags, fluorescent groups, improved properties for in vivo utility and diagnostics, as well as for high throughput screening. And there's been over um, 250 publications on this polymer technology. Uh, we've patented and we're licensing the Polyscope, and so it's mutually beneficial. And the researchers, of course, are, are benefiting, for example, structures of the glycine receptor or the alternative complex three that could never have been seen any other way because uh, only with this technology can you see the bound lipids, the post-translational modifications, the weak complexes using methods including cryo-EM, X-ray crystallography. And so working with Polyscope, a new company has been spun out called PolyScience. We've attracted an industry club, a consortia of international players that are very interested in this alternative to detergents, to solubilizing and analyzing membrane protein targets, which represent half of the drug discovery targets out there. And again, this technology, it's coming uh, in, into a new generation of polymers because of the work being carried out here in Edmonton and our willingness to share openly with the community uh, and in particular through Polyscope to make these reagents and assays available globally um, through this industry club and, and beyond. Next slide, please. And so I've really enjoyed the research here in Edmonton um, and trying to take these, these new ideas to market. Uh, one of the things that I've also wanted to do is share these ideas, uh, these, these pathways for commercialization. In the UK, I had begun an organization called Science Capital, and I've grown that even further here under the name of Discovery Lab. And we've had over 180 companies spin out uh, talk about their new technologies and pitch their plans to investors and business mentors in the past few years. Um, also about 150 advisors have come forward to volunteer their time. Just showing you what a collaborative and collegial environment Edmonton is. They offer their time to help these startups and small companies um, get to market, uh, whether they're local or, or global, and raise funding. In the past year, about 150 million was raised by teams who pitched at Discovery Lab events. Um, in the past few years. And so a lot of money is being raised. And we have a, um, within our panel of advisors, investors, it's about $3 billion uh, that is looking for investable projects. And so there's a lot of cash, both in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and beyond, that's now looking at Edmonton as a great place to invest. And at the same time, we're also aligning the university priorities and the facilities, the transfer services. So it becomes easy, natural to spin out companies. I've got five uh, companies and projects that have commercialization potential that I'm currently pushing forwards. And I'm just one person uh, with, a, with a small lab. So there's a lot of uh, potential. Uh, I, I think what really makes Edmonton special is the culture. Everything is relatively easy here. There isn't really barriers to innovation or collaboration. It's very collegial. And you just need to open a door and find someone willing to talk to you. Uh, it's natural. And that's been a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed the commercialization of partnership potential. And I'm looking forward to staying here for the long term. I'd be happy to take any questions at any point. And thanks for the opportunity to tell my uh, short story. Thank you very much, Michael, for sharing your thoughts and experiences in Edmonton. Next speaker, let's go ahead and questions being at the end uh, being answered. Uh, Dr. Andrew McIsaacs, he is the CEO of Applied Pharmaceutical Information in Innovation. Assistant Dean in the Faculty of Pharmacy and for Pharmaceutical Science at the University of Alberta. Andrew, it's yours. 
thank you so much. Uh, and welcome, everyone. Um, so uh, as my intro stated, I'm the CEO of Applied Pharmaceutical Innovation. Um, what we are is a not-for-profit institute that spun out of the university um, a few years ago to tackle some of the big challenges uh, that exist in drug development. And we've uh, quickly made a name for ourselves in our unique model and its capacity that's establishing Edmonton as a region for people to scale up uh, their innovations. So taking it from the place where uh, Michael would, uh, would basically be spinning out a company and providing the resources and infrastructure and ability uh, for them to grow into a uh, company here within, uh, within Edmonton, Alberta. Um, so we work with a really unique model. Um, we looked at uh, the space uh, of uh, support that uh, pharma usually goes towards, the, the CROs, uh, as well as the academic partnerships. Uh, and we sort of uh, developed a, a program where we uh, do a hybrid model. Um, so typically, if you went to a contract research organization, you'd get professional industry level uh, science that happened quickly, uh, but you'd miss out on some of the innovations that sometimes exist within uh, academia. Whereas going to academia, you know, you get some of that innovative cutting edge research, but you miss out on uh, a little bit of the speed and a little bit of the um, industry focused lens that uh, you find within a CRO environment. Um, so we launched API as a model to provide a hybrid of the two of them. Uh, in a way that builds uh, teams that can work for companies within the life sciences space. Um, so our organization provides uh, drug design, um, med medicinal chemistry and synthesis, regulatory support, um, a lot of the ADME and bioanalytical work that companies need. Um, we provide uh, a characterization in vivo and vitro studies, uh, clinical trial design, uh, population PK, uh, pharmacometrics, uh, and we tie in with groups like Amy on uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, and so the big, the big thing that we're able to provide for companies within the region is the ability to grow teams with that specific expertise. In our model, we work with postdocs and grad students uh, under PIs within a university environment, uh, co-supervised with our industry staff. Um, and so the, the postdocs that work on uh, the projects with industry um, are usually working on a project for a large pharma, like a, you know, a Pfizer or a Takeda. At the same time, they're also working for a spinoff or a startup. Um, and the idea with this system is that as these companies grow and scale within the Edmonton region, um, they can recruit and hire out the postdocs who have uh, been working for the, the projects uh, within the university environment, and they've got that own capacity in-house, um, and they've got someone who really understands their, their program. Uh, so the idea is to be able to enable companies to scale and grow. Um, we've actually worked quite, uh, quite well in this space, um, uh, even in, in uh, incubating companies to start up as drug manufacturers. Um, Edmonton has you know, thousands of graduates from top ranked programs and institutions, um, such as the U of A and Nate. Uh, we've got uh, global top 10 rankings in fields of engineering, pharmacy and pharmaceutical sciences for uh, research. Uh, as well as a really hands-on chemistry program, uh, as well as dec decades of regional experience as a petrochemical center uh, with supply chain logistics support, um, Canada's most hands-on uh, undergraduate programs, uh, and as mentioned before, airport certifications that enable us to handle pharmaceuticals in uh, cold chain uh, supply. Um, so all of this and our location makes us a great uh, destination for the, um, uh, the building of a new industry. Um, so one of, the, one of the projects we recently took on um, is a security of supply uh, chain uh, in, within Canada and a little bit more broadly when it relates to Probothol and some of the other um, uh, medications that are in sh short supply uh, here in Canada. Um, we have enabled a group of uh, intermediate producers in the uh, Edmonton metro region who uh, produce some of the ingredients that would go into uh, some of these uh, pharmaceutical products and have uh, been in the process of establishing a facility to um, enable them to scale up at a GMP level um, for uh, a, sort of a secondary supply system here in Canada, especially as COVID-19 
um, tends to uh, disrupt supply chains. And, and there's a little bit of a question mark over the next two years as to some of the supply within, uh, within the world when it comes to these pharmaceutical products. Um, so working in this, uh, in this space, we've actually been quite successful in building a supply chain uh, using some of these innovations that is lower cost and is enabling us to uh, not to compete directly with the high volume, low cost producers in areas like India or China, uh, but also, uh, you know, the ability for us to um, uh, produce a secondary supply to fill in gaps where, where uh, space is needed within the, um, within the uh, supply chain. Uh, and that's it for me in terms of time. Thank you very much, Andrew, uh, for sharing your experiences and your insights. Uh, next one will be Greg Clark. He is the Vice President of Operations and General Manager of the Gilead Alberta Manufacturing Facility. Greg is also a member, a board member of API, and Greg is also with us here live in Alberta, and the floor is uh, Greg Clark as the next speaker. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Greg Clark. I'm general manager of Gilead Alberta. Uh, Gilead Alberta is a fully owned subsidiary of Gilead Sciences, Inc., which is a global pharmaceutical company located in uh, Foster City, California, just south of San Francisco. Our mission as a site is to uh, support the development and commercialization of innovative new medicines for unmet medical needs. We do that in a number of ways. The first is we develop synthetic processes to produce these APIs or active pharmaceutical ingredients at both laboratory and plant scale. Second, we develop appropriate analytical controls to ensure the quality of the compounds that we're manufacturing. We are tasked with producing appropriate supplies of these clinical materials uh, and commercial materials when necessary. And we have to do this all under GMP or good manufacturing practices because these are going into people. And finally, we also uh, work on next generation chemistry and support our outsourced CMO or contract manufacturing organization network. So prior to becoming uh, part of Gilead in 2006, Raylo acted as one of these CMOs, contract manufacturing organization. And we worked for a number of companies uh, like Gilead, small companies that didn't own their own means of manufacturing or development and helped them uh, get their programs through clinical trials and ultimately through to commercialization at some point. Uh, Raylo was actually started in 1963 when Professor Ray Lemieux, who is a carbohydrate chemist, at the University of Alberta, was approached by a pharmaceutical company to come do contract research for them in the United States. Professor Lemieux countered at the proposal that let him stay in Edmonton with his family and friends, and R and L Molecular Research was formed, which was Ray and Leo. Uh, Leo is his brother, who is a contractor, and actually helped build the uh, first lab building. Uh, R and L became uh, Raylo Chemicals shortly after that. So we started. Uh, we started working for Gilead in the early 1990s. So by the time the company purchased us in 2006, we'd already developed a, a strong business relationship with them and we'd worked on a number of their compounds and even taken some of them through to commercialization for them. Uh, it was also a good uh, cultural fit as we have a diverse workforce and a collaborative team-oriented culture. So one of the questions we often get is, why Edmonton of all places? Number one, uh, we really have uh, a competitive cost environment within North America and, and Europe. Number two, there's a very uh, highly educated workforce available. Number three, we have support of local governments. We have proximity to excellent educational institutions, which have been mentioned already today. And uh, last but not least, we have proximity to the Edmonton International Airport, which facilitates both receipt of raw materials and shipping of the final products that we make out at the end of the day. Another question we're often asked is, what has changed for our site since becoming part of Gilead? And I'm pleased to say that uh, the site has enjoyed quite a lot of growth. When we first became Gilead in 2006, we had approximately 160 employees. We now have more than 370 staff members. In 2014, we purchased four hectares of land uh, in close proximity to our site, what we, that we call the West Campus. And in 2015 and 2016, we built two lab buildings, W1 and W2, uh, 
that total more than 10,800 square meters and house 177 employees. In 2019, we added a second process tower to our original East Campus and uh, added nine additional reaction vessels as well as associated uh, filtration and uh, drying equipment. So this growth would, would really not be possible unless there was an underlying business need, which there was for Gilead. The site has to continue to execute and we've done our best to do that. And you have to be in a supportive uh, environment and we certainly have found that in Edmonton and Alberta. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg, for sharing your thoughts and your perspectives on that. Uh, we are entering now the question and answer period uh, for the next 15 minutes. And I would like to introduce my colleague, Amanpreet Bhatti from the trade and investment team at Edmonton Global. She will moderate the question and answer period. And I invite both uh, presenters on the stage here with us. And we have Michael uh, remotely connected with us as well as the trade commissioner services in Brussels and The Hague for questions. Amanpreet, please. Thank you, Stefan, and thank you to all the attendees and panelists for joining our webinar this morning. Uh, we look forward to having the panelists answer your questions, and so far we've got some great ones. And again, please submit any questions you may have through the chat box, uh, indicating your name and who you'd like the question to go towards. So just let's kick it off. Um, I'll throw the first question off to Andrew, and maybe I'll have Michael join in if he has anything to add. So the first question is from Keith Groen with Orca Therapeuticals out of the Netherlands. And his question is, uh, does the Edmonton me uh, metro region have specific regulations on clinical studies with genetically modified organisms? And would it be an option to bring patients from Europe into Canada to participate in those clinical studies? Just go ahead, Andrew. Awesome. Uh, so that is a little bit technical um, in, terms of its, uh, in terms of its nature. Uh, we do have uh, standard uh, ethics boards within um, our post-secondary system here. Um, the University of Alberta handles uh, most of the uh, clinical trials from the uh, sort of uh, northern uh, half of Alberta, uh, with Calgary and the South hand handling uh, the other trials. Um, uh, I'm not sure if Michael can maybe weigh in a little bit on terms of the specific guidelines around uh, genetic modification, but um, uh, I found that the, the environment here is quite um, open to good science and Health Canada is a great regulator in that aspect as well too. Um, they're re more responsive, uh, especially in the early stage than some jurisdictions um, uh, around the world, especially you know, the FDA and others uh, where there's a little bit more of a uh, scientific lens to what we're doing uh, that, uh, that is a little bit more open. Perfect, uh, Michael, do you have anything to add to that? Sure. I mean, uh, for um, for clarity, I, I run annual events on various topics, including agriculture, and genetically modified organisms have been used in agriculture in Canada for quite a while. It is regulated and accepted here. Um, so, but th that's uh, in the crop sciences, which is of course a huge area here in Alberta in terms of um, the economic impact as well. Um, in terms of other uses, are there more specifics that I could have? from the speaker about what kind of organisms they're looking at? Uh, unfortunately, it was a question that came in. So we'll, uh, we'll reach out to them and see if we can get more specifics and then uh, have you connect with them directly. Yeah, so basically in the crop area, there is certainly a lot of openness and uh, a lot of very advanced crop sciences here in Alberta. So definitely it's accepted. And uh, there's a, a large agricultural uh, faculty at the University of Alberta with lots of collaborations with local um, companies uh, that are trying to develop next generation crops. Perfect. Thank you, Michael. So our next question, I'm going to throw it over to you, Greg. Uh, we have a question that came in from Svetlana Saplinkova from KMT Hapada. And uh, the question is, what is the main focus of Gilead's facility in Edmonton? So we are an API facility or an active pharmaceutical ingredient facility. Most of the compounds we're working on are early stage compounds that are just going through clinical trials. And as you know, there's a very high attrition rate. So the site has the capability to be involved with those compounds, supply clinical trials all the way through to commercialization if required. Uh, our, our site then takes on the role of transferring those processes to, to CMO sites, contract manufacturing organizations, because Gilead is very much an outsourced organization. And we support those manufacturers 
those CMOs throughout the life cycle of the product. If they have a problem, we help them solve it because in an outsourced organization, their success is tied to our support. Does that answer the question? Great, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, all right, the next one, I'm gonna throw it to Stefan and then of course, any of you guys wanna join in. It's, a, it's a more of a generic question. So if you guys wanna share a little bit about uh, building a talent pipeline for this industry in the region. So go ahead, Stefan. So the uh, post-secondary educational institutions we have in this region are a, a cute pipeline and we heard from Andrew uh, as well as uh, from Greg mentioning and uh, Michael as well. Uh, the university and the colleges around uh, provide uh, the academic research part, but also the technicians. Um, so there is a pipeline in all levels uh, which are required for, for manufacturing. And um, then uh, some supporting institutions uh, is um, in the nanotechnology space. I mentioned uh, the National Center for Nanotechnology, which is located here as well as uh, API, uh, uh, AMI, the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute, if you're looking for data and, and artificial intelligence contributions. But maybe Andrew has something to add or, or Greg for that. Sure, absolutely. Um, well, Alberta especially, uh, you know, we, we built our economy over the past you know, 50 years or so as a uh, petrochemical um, province where you know our oil and gas industry is very focused on the chemistry side so as a result we've got a excellent post-secondary system focused on grads uh, from engineering and science who really can understand the sort of uh, engineering you need to build uh, manufacturing sites uh, for chemistry which you know small molecule drug development that's that's exactly what you need as well as a very strong uh, system of post-secondaries with students in a wide range of uh, health sciences. You know, our, uh, our group at the Faculty of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences is ranked top 13 in the world right now for our research output. Um, and a lot of that is the technical skills you need to, to build successful companies in the pharmaceutical industry. Greg also has a... Certainly, we have, uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, U of A graduates who work at our site, and we also have a lot of Nate graduates. So Nate is the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology, located here in the city, and uh, they come out with a two-year uh, chemical technology diploma, and that's an excellent basis for the training that we're going to uh, give them when they arrive at the site. It's a 24-7 manufacturing site. These processes are very complex, but they come with the, the, the skill set. And... Uh, People who have spent time in Edmonton, if we're looking for more experienced people to come to the city, people who have spent time in Edmonton uh, are happy to come here. If they've done their education, their postdoc here, they have no uh, reservations. If you're living in the southern U.S. and you're a little afraid of snow, it's a bit of a question mark for you. But uh, otherwise, uh, anybody who's spent some time here is, uh, knows that it's a good place and, uh, and are happy to return. If I could just pipe in as well, that with Discovery Lab, what we try to do is link everybody who's a part of that ecosystem. So if you have a great idea that you're turning into a prototype, you can tell your story, link up with whether it's an investor, an IP advisor, uh, someone who could provide space, one of the local incubators to find uh, a community of like-minded uh, companies to, to work uh, within that environment. Um, and we also find now companies increasingly moving to Ed Edmonton from the US especially, because it is an attractive place for the, the men uh, some of the reasons mentioned uh, for, for Gilead as well, but for small companies especially, the cost base and the skill base is critical, and, and we offer a great cost base and a lot of skills. I was really, really impressed when I came here with the number of projects that um, had strong commercialization potential, and I, I was really blown away by the fact that within three years, we had 180 people pitch business plans uh, that had strong commercial potential. Some of them come back three, four times and pitch, and every time they get stronger, closer to market, and investment ready. Uh, and, and so it's very natural, very easy here. Um, Discovery Lab is just one of those networks that links us together, but it's, it's very easy to join. It's free, simple, and you can connect to a wide ecosystem here very quickly, very efficiently, and get high quality connections. Thank you, you guys. Um, the next question, I'm gonna throw it over to Samina and Michelle. Uh, what role does Logistics Canada, Logistics and Canada's trade agreements with Europe, Asia, and North America play in uh, these decisions for pharmaceutical companies? And of course, everyone can chime in, but I'll let Samina and Michelle go ahead.
Well, when it comes to logistics, uh, the Netherlands is a real, it's a real hub, it's a real center. And Stefan had mentioned in uh, his opening remarks uh, that there's a link between KLM. KLM is a link between Amsterdam and the Edmonton airport. Um, but certainly part of the, uh, you know, the opportunities that come with trade agreements are tariff eliminations, et cetera. And logistics plays a part in moving the goods, moving the people. Um, CETA also facilitates the movement of intra-company transfer, transferees. So those are a few comments. Michelle, do you have anything to add on that? Just similarly, uh, you know, I think uh, between Benelux, you've, uh, you've hit a real uh, distribution and logistics hub here for Europe. And uh, with the, the free access and, and movement of goods, it's just made it easier for our uh, Canadian and European counter companies to, to get there to move their goods. And we've seen a great uh, increase both in Belgium and Luxembourg, and I believe the Netherlands as well, Samina, of, since CETA has come into force. So we know our companies are taking advantage of it, and uh, it's something that we will continue to promote uh, in pharmaceutical and across many other sectors where it's benefiting greatly. I would also add that it's a great gateway into the US, and a lot of our small companies are looking for a way to get into the US market. And Edmonton has, has that gateway potential. The US is complicated and expensive. Edmonton is simple and not that expensive. And it has the, uh, the networks. Perfect. Um, okay, uh, we'll do a couple of more questions. So, so Greg, I'm gonna throw this one to you. Uh, unique site specific requirements for scalable pharmaceutical innovation and production. Uh, do you have any examples of what those specific requirements would be? Site-specific requirements? Yes, so for existing assets infrastructure for a facility. So uh, obviously we were, we were around since 1963, so we had built up some of that infrastructure. And when you register a, a product with a regulatory body, be it the Canadian government or the US government or, or the European, uh, different European governments, there's an expectation that you will file a change before you move that site. So some of this production tends to be a little sticky. If you start somewhere, you're going to have to continue operating somewhere or you have to get, jump through some hoops to get the to make the changes but uh, it's, it's really basically just having trained people having the right uh, infrastructure and it a successful operation doing mostly small volume and uh, niche type uh, products where you could have a, a lot larger equipment and folks on, on higher volume our site goes from 165 meters to 7600 meters that's just in the plant. We can also do things in 20 liter and smaller in the, in the lab. So the idea is we can make whatever we for the size of the trial. A lot of these materials are very expensive to make at the beginning. So if you need 10 kilos, you're not gonna make 100 kilos. You probably can't find a lot of materials for a So it's just building that equipment up, having procedures in place, standard operating procedures, making everything's clean, making sure that it's documented. It's a, it's a real quality culture and it takes some time to establish, but the infrastructure part of is not that hard. It's worth noting too that there is a a lot of uh, space here in Alberta um, for the development towards some of this advanced manufacturing. Um, you know, you can be within thirty minutes of literally every community within the Edmonton region with the site. So, you know, the staff have the opportunity to live in the downtown core where things are. Um, you know, bustling and busy or in a beautiful suburb with, you know, big lawn and garage. Um, you know, we've got a lot of the, the natural uh, pieces that fit as well too, like uh, low humidity, um, a, uh, you know, a, a real sort of uh, strength in terms of stability of the region and uh, the lack of adverse uh, weather events that tend to gum things up. Um, you know, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that if you were looking for a site to do a greenfield uh, expansion, um, you'd have a whole bunch to pick from here in Edmonton. I think Andrea has a good point about the, no one from our site probably drives much more than about 30 minutes. And in some jurisdictions, you know, doing three times that much each way uh, every day would not be uncommon. And that's a big, uh, that's a big difference for people. I, I might add that uh, also the Alberta Heartland Industry Association, which is part from Edmonton Global, uh, with their municipality, uh, it's one of the largest uh, petrochemical complexes uh, located in this jurisdiction, uh, just uh, 20 minutes outside of the city. 
Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so we have time for one more question, and I think this is a great question for all of our our panelists to chime in on. And it adds, uh, it's kind of connected to the last question as well. But what is our regional strength when it comes to pharmaceutical product development? So Andrew, I'll start with you. Sure. Yeah, we have a lot of expertise uh, in the health sciences uh, groups like Michael's, um, as well as within the um, uh, the field of artificial intelligence um, and chemistry. Um, there is uh, a real strong pharmacy faculty, as I mentioned as well, too. Um, we've, we've come up with a, a lot of great IP, and uh, the unique thing about the Edmonton region is we have the ability to commercialize it. Um, you know, we, we have all of the pieces that you need from that initial sort of discovery and lead selection, uh, but also the ability to, you know, begin doing the ADME work, uh, run the clinical trials, you know, analyze the data at a level that is, you know, uh, world class. So there's the there's all the pieces here within this region that you can sort of assemble into a pharmaceutical company that's just sitting here. And I think that that's probably one of our biggest strengths is the ability to scale up here, um, both our own innovations as well as the uh, innovations that uh, that come from other jurisdictions to to where we are. Yeah, I would add that our institutes are really strong, both in diabetes, cancer, infectious diseases. There's a lot of talent, a lot of great molecules that have been developed here that are still being developed. A lot of great talent that comes with that um, and companies to partner with to, to do the chemistry. Uh, it's a very strong region. We don't talk about it enough. We don't, um, uh, I think, uh, promote what we actually have here. But come and visit. It's a, it's a very strong, deep culture of, of science, technology, especially in the pharmaceutical space. Greg, would you like to add anything to that? I think uh, I think Andrew's actually done a pretty good job of of, uh, of covering it. You know, we can talk about Gilead times, but we functioned and did that scale up work for many years before we became Gilead. So it's been a constant for us. And Stefan, anything you'd like to add? Lastly, yeah, I think uh, one thing. Um, the region has the critical mass of different organizations uh, which come together, but it's not so big that you don't find the connection and the networking within uh, the, the region. That's something I observe. And there are a number of complementary organizations and activities which are running, which are helping each other and uh, are easy accessible within uh, to name Health City as one initiative by City of Edmonton and all the other activities which are going on. Perfect. I think with that, we are coming to the end of this webinar, and uh, I'd like to uh, wrap up here. Uh, we hope you found it useful, and any question you may still have, you can always contact us at Edmonton Global or the Trade Commissioner Services and their teams in your region. Uh, the recording of this webinar will be available end of this week uh, on the website from Edmonton Global. And an electronic copy of the presentation will be shared with um, all the registered participants in the coming week. Thank you very much to all attendees in Europe, Canada, and around the world uh, who participated this, uh, in this session. A special thank you goes to our panelists, Greg, uh, who was here this morning, um, Andrew, and Michael, who was uh, connected remotely uh, with us for sharing their time and their perspectives. I uh, greatly appreciate it for that. Uh, thank you also to the Trade Commissioner Services teams in The Hague and Brussels, who were instrumental to reach out and to get to the audiences in their regions. Um, thank you, Samina. Thank you, Michelle, and your teams uh, for the work you did for that. The webinar would not be possible with all the help and support from the colleagues at Edmonton Global. Thank you to them. In particular, Aman Preet uh, from the Trade and Investment Team, uh, but also Sherry and Chris uh, from the Marketing and Communication Team. They have done a tremendous job to make that possible here. Thank you for the technical support by the team. You don't see behind the cameras here, but uh, they have done uh, a great job to get us in the picture. Wishing all participants in Europe and a good evening and a productive day for the ones who still have a working day ahead of us. And bye-bye um, to everybody else in the world. Thank you. <laughs>